Hey everybody, this video will be focusing on circular motion involving horizontal and bank surfaces. In the introduction video, we discussed that the centripetal force which is required for circular motion is provided by different types of forces depending on the scenario in which circular motion is taking place. So in this video, we'll be focusing on vehicles, masses that undergo circular motion when they are on a horizontal or on a bank surface. When circular motion is taking place on a horizontal surface, the centripetal force is resulted from the frictional force between the mass and the surface. So in the common example of a car going about a circular turn or bend as shown by the diagram, the friction present between the tires of the car and the surface is what's providing the circular motion and the centripetal force. And since that's the case, the frictional force is acting towards the center of the circle as it is the center seeking force, the centripetal force. It is important here to note that the greater the friction force, so the larger the friction between the surface and the tires, there will be a greater centripetal force. We can use the equation for centripetal force to think about the implications of having a larger centripetal force. If the mass of the object of the car stays constant, an increase in centripetal force could mean two things. It could mean an increase in velocity, so that means the vehicle can go around the circular bend at a faster speed, or it could mean a smaller radius. That means the car can go around the bend with a smaller radius, so the bend could be smaller itself. We'll look at the implications in more detail in a few practice questions in a moment. In a real life setting, when a car goes around the bend at very high speed, what usually happens is that the drivers and the passengers in the car will experience an outward pulling sensation, which is the opposite direction to the centripetal force, and this is due to inertia. There will be nothing acting on the passengers until they are exerted upon by the normal force on the outer part of the car. So, what you want to take away here is that although the inertia and the pulling sensation you experience in the car as it's going around the turn is going towards the outside of the circle, the centripetal force and the friction that is providing the centripetal force is still going towards the inner and the center of the circle. So a car rounds a bend on the road that follows an arc of a circle with radius r. The car has a mass of m and is traveling at the velocity b. Explain the following situations. Why are drivers advised to slow down during wet weather, specifically when they are making a bend? So this is because during the wet weather, when the surface is wet, the friction that is present, that's called the static friction Fs, is reduced. And remember, since the friction is providing my centripetal force, this will give me a lower or smaller centripetal force Fc as well. And since the centripetal force is equal to mv squared over r, and the mass and the radius are constant, if we have a smaller centripetal force, then the velocity of the car must decrease as well in order for this car to go about the same circular motion. A car makes a circular turn of radius 20 meters. The coefficient of static friction between the tires and the road is 0.6. Calculate the maximum speed at which the car can safely make the turn without sliding. So we can start the question by drawing a diagram and adding some vectors to analyze the forces that's acting on this car. So let's say this is my horizontal surface, and I've got a car that's going around the bend, and this is the middle of that circular bend. So this over here, this is my radius r. Now on the car, I've got the weight force vector acting downwards, and I've also got the normal force acting upwards, fn. In addition to that, the surface also provides a frictional force on the tires that's acting towards the middle of the circle. So let's call this Fs, static friction. And we know that in this scenario, when it's on a horizontal surface, the static friction is equal to the centripetal force. We can analyze the vectors in a y direction, the vertical plane, or an x direction in the horizontal plane. In the y direction, we know the normal force magnitude must be equal to the weight force. If they are not equal, the vehicle will then be going either upwards or downwards. So since we know it remains horizontal on the surface and doesn't go up or down, the net force in the y direction should be zero. So therefore these two should be equal in magnitude. 
In the x direction, we know the static friction is providing the centripetal force, which is mv squared over r. We can then combine these two equations by using the equation of static friction, which is fs is equal to the static friction coefficient, mu s, times by the normal force. We can replace the static friction here by the coefficient times by the normal force. So in the second equation, I have the coefficient of for static friction times by the normal force is equal to mv squared over r. Let's call this equation 2, and the first one up here, equation 1. If I divide the second equation by the first equation, I'll have the coefficient times by the normal force divided by the normal force is equal to mv squared over r divided by mg. The normal force will cancel out, and so does the mass of the vehicle. And what we'll get here is that the coefficient is equal to v squared divided by rg. So therefore, the velocity squared equals to rg times by the coefficient of friction. So velocity, the maximum speed, so that's called as v max, is equal to square root of the radius, which is zero point, which is twenty meters, times by nine point eight, times by zero point six, which is a coefficient for static friction, and this gives me one hundred seventeen point six meters per second. So this is the maximum velocity at which the car needs to travel at. If the vehicle travels any faster than the speed, it will then slide off, and will be unable to make around the circular bend. Now we've discussed circular motion that occur on horizontal surfaces, we can take a look at surfaces that's inclined at an angle. Any type of surface that's inclined at an angle theta, we call these bank surfaces. Now of course bank surfaces can also have friction, but since these are a bit more complicated, we'll go through them in a separate video. In the second part of this video, we'll look at bank surfaces with no friction. When a vehicle is traveling around a bend that's banked at an angle, it still undergoes horizontal circular motion with the centripetal force pointing towards the center of the circle. And of course, the distance between the center of the circle or the circular turn and where the vehicle is at, this is the radius of circular motion. The vector diagrams for the forces acting on the vehicle on the bank surface is slightly different to that of a horizontal surface we saw earlier. Specifically, while the weight force is still the same, going downwards, the normal force now becomes oblique as it remains perpendicular to the bank surface. Since it's inclined at an angle, the normal force, we can analyze the normal force by breaking this down into a horizontal component and a vertical component by using vector addition. If the bank angle is theta, we can draw a parallel line to the ground and deduce that this angle here is also theta because of alternate angles on parallel lines. And since the normal vector and the surface is at 90 degrees, this angle here is 90 minus theta. So if the theta here is say that's 30 degrees, then 90 minus 30 degrees will be 60 degrees. These two angles will add up to 90 degrees. And since this vector is vertical and the line which is drew is horizontal, the angle between them is also perpendicular, 90 degrees. So that means theta here, or this angle here, will be theta as we're doing 90 degrees minus 90 plus theta. So this will be theta over here. Using this angle, which is the same as the banked angle, the adjacent side, which is a vertical component, will be the normal force, y, the y component of normal force, divided by the normal force itself. This equals the cosine theta. So if you multiply normal the normal force on both sides, you'll get Fn cosine theta. Similarly, the opposite side, which is a horizontal component, will have the expression of Fn sine theta. The normal force and the weight force are the only force vectors acting on the mass when the surface has no friction. Now, what you can hopefully see is that the horizontal component of the normal force, out of all the vectors in this diagram, is the only one that is pointing in the same direction as our centripetal force, which is required for the circular motion. This is why in the first equation, the horizontal component of the normal force is equal to mv squared over r, which is the equation for the centripetal force. 
If we look at the vertical vectors, specifically the vertical component of the normal force and the weight force, these two vectors are pointing in the opposite direction, but they should be equal in magnitude because the net force in the vertical plane should be zero as the vehicle is staying on the surface. If, for whatever reason, the vertical component of the normal force becomes larger than the weight force, then the vehicle will then go off the surface and lose contact. But assuming the vehicle stays in contact with the surface, the vertical component of the normal force will be equal to the magnitude of the weight force. Let's call this equation 2. For any type of bank surfaces with no friction, the way we form these two equations will be always the same. We can then take the two equations and solve them simultaneously. Specifically, what we'll do is we'll take equation 1 and we'll divide it by equation 2. So this one here is equation 1 divided by equation 2. So we'll take n sine theta from the first equation divided by n cosine theta and we'll take mv square over r, which is the centripetal force, divided by the weight force mg. Here, the normal force will cancel out and the sine theta divided by cosine theta will get tangent theta using trigonometry. The mass will cancel out and on the right hand side of the equation, I will get a simple expression of v squared divided by rg. If we multiply radius and g on both sides, we'll get rg tangent theta equals to v squared. And if we square root both sides, we'll get the velocity of the vehicle is equal to the square root of rg times by tangent theta. This velocity is known as the ideal velocity. This is the required velocity for the vehicle if it wants to make around a circular bend without either slipping upwards or downwards. And of course, this expression is only valid for bank surfaces without friction. What you see in this equation is that the velocity is determined by the radius, gravity, and ultimately the angle at which the surface is banked at. Greater the angle of bank surface, so if this angle here is larger, then you can see the velocity will become larger as well. So greater the tangential velocity. So that means vehicles will be able to travel faster if the bank angle is larger. What you should also note is something very interesting, and that is the velocity that's required to maintain the uniform circular motion on the bank surface is independent of the object's mass. In other words, no matter how heavy the vehicle is, whether it's a small vehicle, a bicycle, or a truck, the velocity that's required to go around the bend will be always the same, assuming the radius of the circular turn will be the same. Let's take a look at a question. A car makes a circular turn of radius 50 meters at 40 meters per second. What is the angle the road should be banked at so no friction is required? So for these questions for bank surfaces, it's always good to start by drawing a diagram and add the force vectors to the diagram. So I have theta here, and the weight force is acting downwards for the car, and we've got a normal force that's going perpendicularly to the surface, let's call this Fn, and by resolving the normal force into a vertical component and a horizontal component, we can find that this is Fy and this is Fx. And this angle here, as we said before, is this is theta. So let me just draw the triangle bigger. The hypotenuse is normal force. The vertical component is Fy. And since this angle is theta, the adjacent side here will be Fn cosine theta. The horizontal component will therefore be Fn sine theta. So as we said, Fn sine theta is equal to the centripetal force, Fc, which is also equal to mv squared over r. Let's call this equation 1. For equation 2, we've got the vertical component of the normal force being equal in magnitude to the weight force, mg. This is my equation 2. If I solve them simultaneously by dividing the first equation by the second equation, I will get the normal force sine theta divided by the normal force cosine theta. So this is the vertical component of the normal force. This is equal to the centripetal force, mv squared over r, divided by the weight force, mg. We can cancel the normal force on the left-hand side. We can cancel the mass on the right-hand side. And this simplifies the equation to tangent theta is equal to v squared divided by rg. And 
if we rearrange the equation to make theta the subject, we can get theta equals to tangent inverse of v squared over rg. We can then find the angle the bank server should be at by solving the equation. So v is 40 squared, radius is 50, and g is 9.8 meters per second squared, an angle of 72 to 0.97 degrees.